Hello, and welcome to the new Phobophile channel. I'm Bob Lewis, and this channel is all about fear and horror. The name Phobophile comes from the word phobia, meaning fear or terror, and the suffix phile, or philia, meaning loving or attraction. A phobophile, then, is someone who loves fear, or loves horror. If you're the same way, this channel is for you. As we proceed, we're going to talk about all things horror, fear, creepy. We're going to discuss all of those macabre things and things that go bump in the night. We'll be talking about horror books and horror movies, including some discussions and some reviews. There will be some true horror stories. There will be some creepy videos from time to time. Because I have a psychological background, we'll be talking about actual psychological phobias. Anything related to fear or horror is fair game for this channel. If that sounds like something you like, please feel free to click the subscription button down below so that you don't miss anything. And feel free also to reach out if you have any suggestions for future videos. For this video, I thought I would start off by answering a question that we often get asked. My fellow phobophiles and myself are frequently asked, what is it that you like about horror? It's frequently phrased as, why do you like that creepy stuff? Well, there are a lot of reasons we like that creepy stuff, and I'd like to take a few minutes to discuss just what it is we like about horror. I should note before we begin that there are a lot of theories on why people like horror, and a lot of people have written about why they think the genre is important. This isn't meant to be a complete survey of the scholarly literature, nor a complete survey of what everybody likes. Instead, it's meant to be just a quick explanation of some of my own thoughts. I'm filming this in April of the year 2020. As I speak, the world is coping with the COVID-19 pandemic. As of this filming, the virus has claimed well over 100,000 lives worldwide, and that number is projected to keep climbing. In response, much of the world has gone on lockdown, economies are crippled, lives have been ruined. And yet, many of us are still reading horror novels and watching horror movies. An acquaintance of mine recently asked whether horror is still relevant in such times of real-life horror. I'm not here to rehash the depressing details of the pandemic, but I am here to say that horror might be even more relevant during these times. In order to understand why so many of us turn to horror movies and horror novels in times of uncertainty, though, we first need to understand why we're drawn to stories in general. It probably comes as no surprise to any of you that human beings are fundamentally a storytelling species. Our linguistic capability is perhaps the quintessential human characteristic, separating us from the other animals, and we seem to use it primarily for the telling of stories. We read books and poems. We go to movies and plays and operas. We gossip. Paintings and music can tell stories in abstract form. Even the scientific literature consists of a kind of story. Why? What is it about narratives and stories that we find so compelling? Carl Jung was a Swiss psychiatrist and one of the pioneers of psychoanalysis. Though most of us have heard his name, relatively few understand the lasting importance of his work. Jung had a lifelong interest in the effect of stories on the human psyche, but it was during a period of personal crisis following his falling out with the other great pioneer of psychoanalytic thought, Sigmund Freud, that he found himself increasingly turning to myths and stories for comfort. As a result of this period in his life, he began to notice common patterns not only in the stories he read, but also in his own dreams and in the stories told by his patients. Jung became convinced that the structure of these stories, but not their details, was hardwired and embedded in human biology. Specifically, he created a theoretical structure of the human psyche which was divided into three parts. The conscious mind, the individual unconscious, and the collective unconscious. The conscious mind consists of the thoughts and behaviors we're aware of. It involves logical thinking, explicit memory, and voluntary actions. The individual or personal unconscious is unavailable to our conscious mind, and it consists of repressed impulses and traumas. The collective unconscious contains the patterns all humans are naturally born with. It consists of archetypes. 
Unconscious thoughts, though they're inaccessible to the conscious mind, nevertheless affect our behavior and our mental well-being. To oversimplify Jung's thinking a bit, the purpose of psychoanalysis is to bring unconscious thoughts, or complexes, into the conscious mind so that we can understand and resolve them. For instance, if an individual is stuck in a bad relationship, the conscious mind might rationalize staying with one's partner while the personal unconscious, that repository of unexpressed thoughts and repressed emotions, might nevertheless cause one to lash out at that partner in a way one might later regret. So a goal of psychoanalysis would be to bring those thoughts into the conscious mind so the individual could rationally assess the relationship. The collective unconscious functions in a similar way, but rather than containing repressed memories or traumas or impulses from the individual, it contains the archetypes and base instincts common to all human beings. We don't need to learn, for instance, to run away from a threatening animal. These archetypes are the stuff of stories. To Jung, all stories, indeed all mythologies, are projections of the collective unconscious, and this is why they seem so universally recognizable. Joseph Campbell was an American scholar of literature. In his most well-known book, The Hero with a Thousand Faces, he drew heavily from Jung's work to construct what he called the monomyth, or the hero's journey, an archetypal template common to many stories. In fact, George Lucas explicitly cited Campbell's work as an inspiration for Star Wars. Returning to Jung, we also need to understand that Jung created another three-way division of the human psyche, consisting of the ego, the self, and the shadow. The ego is the heart of our consciousness. It's our sense of personal identity. It's what we invoke when we say, this is me. The shadow is the dark and unknown portion of our psyche outside of the ego. It consists of those unconscious drives and repressed memories. The degree to which it controls our lives is directly proportional to our unawareness of its contents. The self consists of the totality of the human psyche. It's an amalgamation of the ego and the shadow. To Jung, the primary psychological purpose of the second half of life is the integration of the ego into the self. This requires what we can call shadow work, or identification of these unknown parts of ourselves. Jung called this process of integrating the ego and the shadow into the self individuation. It's here that we return to stories, because stories are an essential part of this process. Not only do stories contain the information that we need to bring items from either the personal or the collective unconscious into the conscious mind, but Campbell's monomyth itself reflects the process of individuation and psychological development. We need stories because they tell us how to integrate our shadows with our egos. While this is true of stories in general, Joseph Campbell himself hinted at the particular importance of horror stories when he said, The cave you fear to enter holds the treasure you seek. With that in mind, let's move forward and explore why horror stories in particular appeal to us, and why I argue that their saliency is only increased during times of trouble. Howard Phillips Lovecraft, better known as H.P. Lovecraft, was an American author primarily of weird fiction or horror fiction, and is best known as the creator of the Cthulhu mythos, which has spawned countless offshoot books, movies, video games, and even merchandise. Though we sadly don't have a lot of time to discuss Lovecraft's works today, and hopefully I'll get the opportunity to discuss his writings in more detail in a future video, he managed to express exactly what we're talking about when he said, The oldest and strongest emotion of mankind is fear. And the oldest and strongest kind of fear is fear of the unknown. The known is easy and safe. We're familiar with it. We know how to negotiate it. The unknown is chaotic and frightening. It provides both threats and opportunities, of course, but because it is unknown, we don't yet possess the knowledge to tell one from the other until we explore. This exploration of the unknown parallels Jung's integration of the shadow into the self, but because the unknown frightens us, 
The archetypal stories most relevant to this exploration of the unknown are horror stories. One of the benefits of the horror story is that it allows us to explore the unknown, even to integrate our shadows, in relative safety. Because we know that the horror story is fiction, we're able to dip our toes in the water of the unknown. We're able to take that first step of exploration. While horror stories do sometimes evoke fear, it's a controllable fear because our conscious minds, our egos, are aware that we're reading or watching a work of fiction. Even if we're reading a true horror story, it's distant enough from us that our conscious minds can easily rationalize away the threats. And yet, by engaging in this exploration, we're taking those first exploratory steps into the unknown. Of course, we don't necessarily think about Jungian analysis while watching a horror movie. The reasons we actually like them at the individual level have to do with our personal aesthetic preferences. Maybe we treat them as an escape from our daily lives. We might just like the jolt of adrenaline we get from being scared. In fact, one of my old psychology professors once hypothesized in passing that people might like horror movies for the same neurological reasons they like spicy foods. But in the background, important psychological processes are taking place, and those become all the more important in times of cultural uncertainty. Whenever the world seems to become a more frightening place, people don't stop seeing horror movies or reading horror novels. Rather, times of social uncertainty or cultural upheaval tend to correspond with resurgences of the horror genre. To provide just a few examples, consider Mary Shelley's novel Frankenstein. It appeared at a time in which rapid scientific and technological development worried a lot of people. There were concerns about the rate of scientific development and of a resulting loss of humanity. Indeed, as 21st century science continues to progress, some of those fears are still with us, which is partly why we still read and enjoy Frankenstein, and is also the source of countless other books and films. One of my personal favorite novels, Bram Stoker's Dracula, similarly appeared at a time of great uncertainty. When Dracula first showed up, the British Empire was engaged in widespread exploration, sparking certain feelings of xenophobia. Just as Dracula travels to England in the novel, people of the time were concerned about what British explorers might inadvertently discover or bring back during their explorations. Dracula also explored themes of sexual deviancy at a time when that was a major cause of cultural concern. <laughs> as if there's ever been a time when it wasn't. The same is true in modern times. Godzilla appeared in the wake of the nuclear bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Modern concerns about mental health and the associated stigmas have spawned such films as The Babadook and Hereditary. Horrific images returning to the United States from the Vietnam War, coupled with social unrest at home, corresponded with a revival of interest in horror. Fears about an increasingly secular American culture corresponded with the release of The Exorcist and The Omen. Conversely, fears about religious movements and religious paranoia have spawned their own films, like The Witch. Modern fears related to the internet, social media, and privacy have resulted in such films as Cam, Friend Request, and the series Black Mirror. Now, in light of this pandemic, many of my friends have been reading or watching Stephen King's The Stand, a story in which a plague kills the majority of the human population. Why should this be the case? There may be an element of morbid curiosity, but I think it's more a matter of that safe exploration of the unknown. Often, when people see a psychologist or a psychiatrist for treatment of a phobia, they undergo what's called exposure therapy, in which they are gradually exposed to what they fear under controlled circumstances. Arachnophobes might look at photos of spiders, and eventually build up to holding a tarantula at a nature center. People who are afraid of heights might start with visualization exercises and gradually build themselves up to the point of climbing to the top of a tall structure. Many of us unconsciously seem to be doing the same thing with horror books and horror movies. We gradually explore the things we're afraid of within the controlled environment of a novel's pages or a television screen. In doing so, we're able to explore the unknown, confront our shadow, and better equip ourselves for the times in which we live. Thanks for watching, Phobophiles. I hope you found this interesting, though by no means will all of my content on this channel be so academic. As I mentioned at the beginning, I'm planning on doing a lot of different things on this channel, ranging from reviews of horror books, movies, and video games, 
discussions of news and trends in the genre. Hopefully I'll eventually be doing some original scary videos and scary stories. So if that sounds like something you'll be interested in, I hope you all will stick around and see what's coming next. In the meantime, as much as it makes me feel like a whore to say so, please be sure to like and subscribe. It really helps me out. And let me know in the comments, what is it that draws you to horror, particularly in these troubled times? Take care, and stay scared.